furnace, the words rebirth, the rebirth. <clears throat> there was a gap there for me. Yeah. Well, I had it, you know, you fill the gap of rebirthing from one identity to another. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> the way that I had been, the way that my life has manifested itself is that the, the rebirthing for me was from the ego to all the manifestations of the ego mm -hmm. into, interestingly enough, of the, the, the uh, <coughs> what you just took us through uh, in the awareness meditation, what it's always, what has ever happened to me is that I go from the ego to awareness every time. For me, there's never been anything else, other place to go. And <clears throat> awareness is actually the easiest place to be. Ego is the hardest place to be. But the, probably my question is, wh why wouldn't I just stay in awareness instead of hanging out in the ego and all those different manifestations. Hmm. I mean, there are a lot of things, you know. But that's, you know. <laughs> but that awareness, that, that ego. That's why, that's why people train in something, like trained in meditation, which is really the training in awareness. I see that now. Yeah. And uh, Molly, <laughs> Molly and I have been meditating uh, every morning. Mm -hmm. um, and it's become a practice. Mm -hmm. It is the practice mm -hmm. for me because I find myself mm -hmm. in that meditation mm -hmm. uh, somewhere in my ego. Mm -hmm. And when I stay there, I'm pretty miserable. But the minute that I move into awareness, mm -hmm. I'm happy. In fact, I can feel my heart in awareness. That's where... Uh, mm -hmm. That's where love lives, is in awareness. There's no other place for it to be, for me, anyway. So, um, I, th that has become a practice for me, but I still find myself <laughs> um, hanging out in one manifestation or another of ego. Mm -hmm. Now, why would I do that? <laughs> I mean, it's the work. It's it's miserable <laughs> to be an ego. It's hard, totally miserable. Awareness isn't. It's 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 a wonderful place to be. It be it's easy. Hmm. So I I just can't figure that out. Why why I don't want to figure it out actually. <laughs> but maybe I'll find out from you. Why would one person stay in ego instead of awareness? Well, <sighs> my um, I'm my my pause is feeling the dimension the, for me personally as I hear you it's the, an epic dimension of questioning it's you know it's as existential as one can get when the ego as I assume you mean it is satisfied there's joy and happiness called relative human experience <laughs> yeah. uh, it begs the question what does ego mean to one and does I, do I have to overcome ego? Do I have to reinvent the meaning to be less negative? So I take the ego out of the ego. Negative self-flagellation. You know, there's so many ways in which the ego invents itself and disguises itself that sometimes... Yeah.
So a lot of the answers that I find are reinventing the meaning and the definition of what I mean by what I don't see. Like I want to seek enlightenment, but maybe I'm already enlightened. You know, I want to be happy, but maybe I'm already happier than I could ever be if I got what I wanted. Well, as far as I'm concerned, awareness uh, is enlightenment. I mean, maybe there's something else that's enlightenment, well, but awareness is fine for me. Well, there, 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 then, then my, where I would go is, where I go is how to expand the scope or the environment of that experience of awareness to include the ego. To include the ego. What a wonderful thought. So that you're, you're the whole flower, not just the blossom. You're not just the fragrance. You know, in Burma, where I lived, I think you know that. I lived, they have a cultural etiquette to when they bring flowers to a holy spot, whether it be in your home with someone on a, who's deceased or you bring it to a monastery and you place it you know, on an altar where there's generally a Buddha, they have a, they're beautiful to look at when they're cut and beautiful, right? My point is, not to get too carried away, is that they don't take them away when they fade away. They leave them there. Mm -hmm. So they re they expand, expand the meaning of beauty. You know, beauty is more than the flower. The beauty of transformation is more beautiful than the fragrance of the flower. So, you know, include rather than try to overcome through negation, the conquest style rather than the epic archetypal mother of an embrace behavior. It doesn't mean that we don't obviously specifically choose to evolve patterns of speech and thought and action. There's appropriateness in that refinement. But then there's the larger perspective for me, which is I don't want to die with a limited perception of my worth. I have flaws, but it's held in grace. Mm -hmm. So take, taking the war out of the duality. And that's a very challenging thing to co-occupy complexity with, with honor, with grace, with love. Yes, I see you, ego. I still have the tendency to want to live. I don't like necessarily the things that I hear inside of myself or with that particular person. I see you, I hear your dislike, and I still love you, and I, my love for that particular judgment, I hope, relaxes a little bit of your need to think that you, you know, you own me, I own you. That would have to be done with pure awareness. The only way that's cool. It had to be come from pure awareness in order to do what you just said and embrace the Do you have do you do you see that you have what it takes yes. to and do you do. you do and you can point to it as clearly as you could something very discernible in your life. You know what that awareness is and you know that it's pure. You can take yourself there when you need to, when you want to, mm -hmm. on your terms. Yes. Well, that, that's called, for me, that's called mindful intelligence. It's a very interesting interior asana, if, to use in a yoga analogy, mm. that deliberately and repeatedly you repeat certain yoga asanas the same way you would repeat the asana of pure awareness, the mindful intelligence of repeating pure awareness so that habit becomes nature. And that's the gift of a spiritual life, I think, to state the obvious. That's the gift of a Dharma life. And I think that's why people that I've known have chosen to inhabit the spiritual life because of that conscious ability to engage 
consciousness consciously with pure awareness to overcome these conditioned habits of self-judgment and denigration. And we're mild in relationship to some of the complexities that some individuals must encounter. They, they choose to violate, they choose to dominate, they choose, look at the world today. It's in the hands of about 50 people and the fate of 8 billion of us, not to mention the unborn, are in the hands of you know the, the titans, the oligarchs, and so look at the behaviors that they have that they're unaware of. So by way of saying you're really a refined human mind to say the things in my humble way that I hear you, to really, wow, okay, I can really enter my greatness here. I can learn to talk to myself beyond just pure awareness. I can learn to goddamn get down here. I can be in my greatness because I'm a really remarkably, you know, warrior type individual. I care. I care about my inner environment. I care about my communication. I care about the way I hold myself. I care. I care about this pure awareness and I'm going to wake up more and more to waking up more and more. And so, you know, Summer will know because she's been over to my place a few times. Um, I've developed over the decades a habit of, you know, this is not an indirect suggestion or even remotely an insult because there's so many beautiful things in people's homes that I photograph even. Uh, but I say take everything down that is other and bring everything up and leave everything up that's personally reflective of you being better, not just aesthetically pleasing. So. I'm driven by words and energy within words and meaning. So my house is covered over, the paintings, the art are covered over with notes to myself. Reminders of what I hear you say, pure awareness. Lots of things, phrases, words, sentences. I mean, hundreds of them. I wish I had more space and if it was my place, I'd have everything anointed with reflections on me being better, bigger, deeper, more intimate, more awake, along with my drugs. <laughs> so create an environment where your musicality roars and sings. That's the, that's the key right now. We've got a chance. I don't know what your circumstances are on a financial level or people near you. Create an environment that's so radically aesthetic to the inspiration of heightened awareness, not just what pleases the eye. Not to which just soften something, but okay, instigate, elevate, ignite, you know, really I'm on fire kind of energy, despite being weak at times. I can't get out of bed sometimes. That's so rare for me. It's like, what in the hell, Jose? It's hard to talk. Sometimes you go, the pain is so acute, you go, I'm not going to go down the road. I don't want to be big farmer's little boy. No, 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 no. And so it's ego for me is like, oh, God, it's not going to work out. It's going to be a gradual, rapid deterioration of your senses and your cognitive functions. And that, too, is ego for me. I'm not going to collapse with the collapse. Fuck off, man. So I humor myself sometimes. Anything at all to keep the bonfire of transformational beauty alive in me call it pure awareness, whatever you want to do it. But just, you know, create a castle, a kingdom, an ashram, a temple that is so specific to heart start, you know, whatever you need to do to go, whoa, reminder, pay more attention here. Reminder, inspire that place in you. And maybe you have that. So that's, that's so some of the things. Good, absolutely wise, intimate dialogue of trust rather than questions about how you're doing. You know, you don't want to hear any more about that. And yes, the world is compelling, but it's not. So there came a point for me where I'm going, okay, well, it took me a little while. Summer asked, did it take some time? It did take some time. I've been talking about being in retreat. 
ever since I got diagnosed 10 months ago. And prior to that, I was in retreat, but not really, really in retreat. And so I've been always like, where can I go to be in retreat? Look at the loop of that ego. Where can I go to be in retreat? (laughs) Burma's decimated. Bali is closed unless you've had 16,000 boosters. So where I am is like, well, how did I find myself in a temple? And why aren't I occupying it with, I'm in a sacred temple in retreat? Another form of ego, right? So take time out of the dialogue. The more immediacy I give to pure awareness, the more it develops, in other words. So rather than being pure aware, take postponement out of it and just Wow, I am, I am alive. Pure awareness includes that too. Back to the looping back around to the original conversation. To include more expansive definitions, felt experiential definitions of the meaning of pure awareness. It holds ego like a mother would to a child who cries, weeps, Mom, I don't I want to go. No, I want your breast. No, you've got to develop warmth of our embrace, but it's, come on now, you know, and other times you're just holding each other in such grace, and it comes a time where I'm not a mother, but I'm a parent, where there's individuation and there's separation. I can't even imagine what an adult feels when a child has been convicted of serial killing. I can't imagine what that must be like, or to be an assassin or a terrorist, I don't know. To have to embrace that on such a genetic level. I can't, sometimes I I really fantasize about creating some kind of existential mind bomb of redemption for satanic embodied men. You know, what would it be like if I had an hour and a half or a day and a half with Sir Joseph Biden? You know, what would I bring to him? And Dr. Joe was there to keep, you know, things all civil. And I brought in Dr. Anthony, sociopathic Fauci there too. And a few of my other pantheon of Satan figures. What would I do to really bring pure awareness to that space rather than Alan's ego to dominate? (laughs) You know, I'm creating a film based upon that kind of interest. And I say this not so much about me, but about, okay, what would I do here to ignite a transformational inspiration to redeem everything in me rather than through pure awareness overcoming it? Redeem its innate beauty. Take the ego out of the ego. What is wrong with ego? Why should that blemish start hard? What's wrong with imperfection? Okay, you got a very refined edge here that you're going on, Alan. What about enlightenment? Does it include anger, rage, and genocide? I don't know. But right now we're in a world where that is real and I refuse to take it on. And I refuse to take on any complicity that I see in myself for those qualities in myself. Complicity, very disguised form of ego. So vigilance, I'll end here. There's something about making peace with the elements of being that aren't quite what we want them to be. It doesn't mean caving into their strength, the coexisting I've interviewed close to 300 political prisoners and I brought forth their voices in four books called Burma's Voices of Freedom. And they were all people who lived between two and 21 years in prison as prisoners of conscience. Many of them by function as torture, I hear, but also repeatedly tortured to be away from family, wife, husband, children, no medicine, no toilet, no blanket sometimes. I met one gentleman who had no pillow, no blanket, no toilet for 21 years alone. 
from his leading journalist. I interviewed him five one and a half hour sessions. How did you get through that, if I can ask you? Okay, it's not that he didn't have demons, he said, but my freedom was no one else's to take. He learned how to coexist in conscience and dignity. Those two words are a higher virtue than pure awareness to me. Just feel the innate dignity of your being as you are right now and include and include and include that too. We are in a navigational process towards a heightened trans-egoic state, I hope. Call it ultimate enlightenment. My desire is to be with a Buddha and to see it with boys and girls firsthand in myself and them. Uh -huh, got it, ego's gone. Until then, I'm gonna coexist with elegance and grace finesse, inspiration, satire, and at the same time empower what I do have as worth, which is, you know, fucking I'm on it. I might have flaws and limitations, but my spirit is in high dignity. I care about my environment and the environment of the future and the environment of my heart. So take refuge in what gives you the smile, not the frown, it's not enough. More ego. You're the director, you're the producer, you're the actor, but you're not the pretender. The ego is a pretender. And don't give life to that. That's my experience. What's that? The pretender? Yeah, it's an illusion. It's just an artifice of consciousness as far as I can see in meditation. I've seen so many things that come in that try to allure you. Greed, fear, delusion, 10,000 degrees of these states of mind. The beauty of the Dharma is that you shine a light right through them and they just fade, as it's been said, like a phantom, a dream, a bubble. You know, Mara is substanceless. But dignity is the marrow of our entirety. That's been my experience. Otherwise, we'd be living, you know, and possibly fearing that it's an evil dynamic. I don't give life to these things. It's we're in a spectrum of goodness overcoming our inability to understand how to include and overcome. And I refuse to be less than this so-called illusion, this ego. I've had dark moments, mind you, you know, where, but never enough to want to harm someone. So, and this, you know, if you have doubt about your real worth, then seek, you know, radical, intimate psychological support who is able to help support you in positioning your awareness on the highest virtues of your identity to shift the habit from ego to the strength of your character, learning how to remember that. I'm in therapy 40 years now, sometimes twice a week. And I've learned to have my own relationship to my own self-therapy. But you can't overcome the, the, the spectacular beauty of really wise friendship. But since I live alone, and I'm not sure about you, and you don't see many people, I don't activate your spiritual practices to the point where they overcome you, and you can't believe how beautiful you become. You know, maybe you're a little bit need to call yourself in and say, hey, I could do more. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe I can do more. Maybe I need to strengthen those muscles, strengthen those things. Although I walk slowly and so on and so forth, but my spiritual anatomy is still 19. It's a martial artist, actually. You know, go there. What can I do to strengthen that pure awareness? What's the intelligence of that? And I would write down a list of five things. What can I do to strengthen my pure awareness to make it very practical? So I hope there's something maybe in there. Namaste to you. And may you had something you wanted to say or ask? Take your time, please.
the rebirth of the earth at this time. Dark ages, renaissance. Dark time now globally. And the rebirth of humanity and the earth. And that I'm, I'm, yeah, what's the right word? I'm, in my awareness, I'm aware of the, the rebirth breaking down of old systems and even this person totally redeemed I hope can survive whatever else is coming to it a rebirth so you're, you're birth and everybody that's part of it that so you, you're, you're associating the rebirth of a new consciousness within the collective right and also how that will affect the earth if the earth is demanding it of us the earth is say again Yeah, yeah. That the earth somehow is letting us know, it's giving us signs, it's we're part of it. Right, right, sure. Go on, take your time. It's, it's giving us signs. Right, it's, it's happening. It can happen. And is that, you're just sharing a belief system that you have? Yes, I'm just sharing a belief system that I have and that I experience. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing it. <clears throat> And I, I don't want to cut short that. It is, and you had no question, right? No, I just wondered if you had any inkling or exploration around that theme that you... Around that theme. Um, well, I have, and I have, but not specifically in the way that I sense that you may be coming from it or the way that I interpret it. Um, the reemergence of a higher consciousness out of the environment of this epic unconsciousness, to put it lightly. You know, I've studied a bit of history, you know, the endless massacres on our blessed earth, right? The decimation, desecration, the genocide of indigenous cultures is well known and documented, right? From Europe, everywhere the white Protestant religious left, right, and center went, it did so at the expense of the indigenous cultures, either through calculated acts of mass murder or ideologic persecution and witchery and killing of anyone who had any different opinion than their fascism. So humans have been a real plight overall. Yes, we've had our moments of pharaohs and pyramids and gurus and teachers, and there's the rare saint on those walls. <coughs> but it's been in a, a boiling pit for the majority of the people of a cauldron of hell, as far as I can see. I would, I've interviewed lots of people who've lived through epic genocides and the trauma never leaves their lives. Mm. I've written books specifically in context of being in a genocide. I have many friends that I know who are survivors of ethnic cleansing, torture. And it's a very different perspective to see that the trauma that they've suffered is a necessary something ingredient for the cosmological earth that we're on to regenerate into a higher beauty. It's a little bit of, in a weird, for me, a little bit of victim bashing, trauma-inducing, indirect, negating, shaming. Oh, it's only going to be for the better. Like if I had someone in the room today who had been gang raped, a whole group of women, and asked the question, do you see your gang rape as something positive for the future generation of a higher consciousness? I don't know what they would say. So it's very hard for me to answer a question like that in any real terms because I don't suffer in a way in which the vast majority of people are suffering. I don't know what it's like to be in Hong Kong and be now 
disappeared in a prison camp in Hong Kong forever at 19 years old. So it's hard to really have a perspective. Um, I just wish it wasn't so. I can see that on a personal level, that the higher the complexity that I've faced and have seen and in my own life right now, I have taken it higher. Could I hypothesize that that could be maybe true for others? Is there a wisdom in a so-called collective intelligence that supersedes the individual where this is a higher embodied truth? I do try to see into the psychic dimension of a collective. I'm open to that, fully open, but this, I'm sharing with you my openness with the dialogue without any clarity about the belief. And so I'm more into fluidity of an intelligence that's willing to feel the unrecognized shadows of something to illuminate the very hypothesis in action. The more light I bring to the darkness, the more truth that belief becomes. Proactive engagement. So the only way to know is empirically. And then I come right back, circle right back around to Alan. You don't really know. It's a very interesting thought. I do believe in the power of good over evil. And I refuse to participate that we're born into really a tragic cauldron of collective invenerating hells. Although there are lots of people who could testify that, hey, listen, dude, you are among the 0.001%. You are so narrow on your life on Maui. I just wish you could just see what it means to embody a day in the life of a political prisoner in Tibet. You know, you know the Dalai Lama, I met him a number of times, but I went to a conference. I was invited to a conference in 1989 in Newport Beach where the year he won the Nobel Peace Prize. There were 3,000 psychotherapists there. It was Buddhism and psychotherapy. And I was invited to teach adjunct to some who wanted to participate in mindfulness, Vipassana meditation. I'd come back as a monk. Among many things that were compelling about the group, he was asked at one point, do you have anyone, have, I, have you read this in my book or anything like that? Or, no, okay. Um, and it relates to your question. Um, I think, I'm not sure. <laughs> he was asked, you know, you're winning the Nobel Peace Prize, you're a man of great epic kindness, people adore you, a man of peace and wisdom. Do you have anyone in your life? This is ad libbing and a kind of a little bit of a playful rendition of something. Do you have anyone in your life who you look up to as your kind of epic spiritual hero? Okay, in a nutshell, he said, I do. And he described this gentleman as a man living in Tibet. He may have passed away now. I don't know exactly the time era, but he called him by his Tibetan Buddhist name and it translated as the weeper. Okay. And I'll go right to the punchline first. He said, the weeper was a man who cried most of the time. Okay. This man had made a aditant or a dedication to evolve his empathy and his compassion as the vocation of his life. He didn't want to hypothesize about anything. All he wanted to do was develop compassion. And yet he was called the weeper and he cried all the time. Okay. So the weeper would go about the day in his village in town. The Dalai Lama was said to have said or explained to the group. And I remembered it either rightly or wrongly or partially where he would find someone, an individual, who was truly unambiguously suffering. Say, hypothetically, in the room right now, there was a young girl who came in from the interrogation center in Rangoon, in Burma. And she's brutalized. She's weeping naked. She's hungry, she's starving, and she's bruised, and she's been raped. 
and somehow we can see her as an entity here. Well, the weeper would go into some place in the village and seek out someone who was suffering. And the Dalai Lama was said to have said, and at least I can remember him hearing it, it was a long time ago, he, he, the weeper would get down on his metaphorical literal knees and make energetic heart contact with that being. And his whole practice was the transference of self to other, the active ability to reference self energy to other energy and take empathy and compassion out of the thought. I want to feel you so fully. I am in your mind and body the best as I can as an outsider, occupying the clarity of your emotionality as best as I can from this outside point, point of view. Okay, real compassion. Let me feel, let me have the courage to feel your circumstances as you feel. And I want to know in my heart the intelligence of compassion. What can I do to uplift you from your suffering? That alone for me is like, I go like, what? When has someone ever done that for you? They do it indirectly, but they go about their business. No one drops down, makes a vocation. Alan, I'm dedicated to developing compassion for you. I want to be your benefactor, your lover, your mother, your cook. I'll do anything possible to uplift your life. Whoa, right? We want to marry those kind of people. Well, this man made a vocation out of developing empathy and compassion. The Dalai Lama said he would get in there, develop empathy, and rather having the ability to know what to do, the Dalai Lama told 3,000 psychotherapists, he cried. All he could do, it was so overwhelming that the weeper developed the name, this is my hero. He wept most of the time because his vocation was to feel without separation, as much as he could do it, the suffering of another person. Now that's an easy form of suffering, a gang raped young woman in Burma. All of us would just cringe, right? And we'd be so sensitive to our behavior, our movements, our thoughts. I don't know what we would, you're women, I don't know, you, you, you know. What would you do for this woman? And she's just an image that's been allowed us psychically to see her circumstances over there. Will we become activists for Burma today? Will we turn our lives towards the release of all sexual violated women worldwide? You know where I'm going, right? So, so many ways to realize the truth of a belief, the truth of an experience. Anyway, almost done. So then the weeper met an old man who was bent over. He had hepatitis, his skin was yellow, his teeth were broken. He could barely look up. He was carrying a staff. His feet were swollen and cut, hungry. And the weeper would metaphorically and literally get down and make eye contact, vibrational heart contact with this old man. And that condition, too, is me. But rather than doing anything, really, he cried. He was so overwhelmed by his emotionality. OK. Take someone we don't particularly feel compassion for. OK, I'm, I'm not going to go around the room like say, OK, Donald Trump's in the room. OK, most, he's an easy target for most people. For me, Biden is far worse than anything at all with orange man bad. And then you put in, if Fauci were in the room today, I'd be going, hey, dude, man, my compassion is non-existent for your ass. I want you to jab yourself until you die. Really, you mean that? Yep. Yep, I do. I want you to feel, it's a rubber needle, by the way, it's a fake needle, but I want you to do it until you can't do it anymore. Why do you want me to do that? Because I want you to exhaust your fetish with trying to vaccinate the entire animal population, the insect population, the whales, the humans, the babies. Boosters, 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 ineffectiveness, inefficient, still transmissible. I can still get COVID. Yeah, I've had 4,000 boosters later. 
but you're not dying. You're not dying. You will take one more booster and then you killed yourself with the last needle and the last COVID person is still breathing. Are we doing that to ourselves? So he's not an easy person for me to have compassion for. Limits to my belief system in the action. You know what I'm saying? And he's an easy target. Take someone who's like the dictator in Burma, Ming Online, the Hitler in Burma, doing those people to my family. It makes my blood boil. It makes me want to stay alive to develop combat skills, to reinvent my age and develop being a Navy SEAL and learn how to be a far distant drone assassin and take that asshole out. That's my compassion. Really? You mean that? Mm, yep. Yep, I do. Really? So this big spectrum of that question, you know. Anyway, Dalai Lama ended. He said, that's my hero. And I went on in my own process of thinking, you know, crying all the time is not something that people consider to be a spiritually advanced state of mind. Okay, a little bit of vulnerability. Okay, I watched her TED talk. Vulnerability is beautiful, blah, 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 blah. But hey, listen, enough, enough, enough crying, crying, crying. But hey, listen, I listened to the Dalai Lama. His hero is the weeper. I'm developing compassion. Really? I think you got unrecognized trauma. Go to a psychotherapist. No matter how enlightened she or he is, it's like, he's still crying, you're still crying. I can't get over it. Everywhere I go, I see an insect being crushed. I feel like the Dalai Lama's hero, the weeper. Okay. I go to Whole Foods and I see all that meat behind the counter. I can hear the cries of them being slaughtered. I'm weeping in Whole Foods. They're bringing in an existential psychotherapist to help me out. Uh, I think you can come back next Wednesday. We're going to have to up the cost of these sessions to about $500 an hour now. It's really hard for me to deal with your crying, but I love you. I've known your whole family. I used to go to Waldorf like your kids did. But I'm not going to abandon you in your time of need because I know you want to believe in the goodness coming out of this horror. You know where I'm going with all this. So. And eventually your therapist says, listen, I love you, but I think you need to be on an SSRI. It's the only way to deal with your spiritual enlightenment. Spiritual. Enlightenment. And if you don't mind before you take it, you should get your booster. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so who do you believe? And it goes like, okay, fuck, man. And you come right back to what's true for you. And the last thing I want to say is what I believe to be in my story is there's nothing that supersedes the action of your belief over your belief. Put food on the table. Give someone a Kleenex. Offer them a donation. Hold their hand. Send them prayers of loving kindness. Join Amnesty International. Go there and be a frontline journalist. Report the evidence of the vulnerable. The, you know, whatever you do, embody the action of our dharma, our beliefs. So that's my fuller response to your question. And it may or may not have any bearing. I didn't say it to have any bearing. But I have a Dalai Lama story about a friend of mine who worked in Washington as a lawyer who brought immigrants from countries, El Salvador and all that, back in those days. And he had worked with a man in the House of Representatives who was trying to get the whole situation in Tibet recognized and helped. And so the Dalai Lama asked to meet my friend, who was from India, but acclimatized to being an American, part of law, all that. And I um, went to see the Dalai Lama with his daughters, and he couldn't, he couldn't speak to the Dalai Lama. All he could do in his presence was weep. And his daughters looked up at him, and they were totally dazzled. And 
and he just kept on weeping. And the Dalai Lama said to him, Thank you for crying the tears that I cannot cry. Mm. Yeah. That's exactly what he said to the group of 3,000 therapists. <laughs> he said, why he's my hero is that he can cry and I can't cry. Mm-hmm. So apparently he's used that after that time as well. I don't really believe that though, frankly. I, I believe that every human being cries. In some form. Mm-hmm. And I believe that he probably cries far more than he his vulnerability allows him to admit (laughs) because I think he's very human and I don't think you could witness a genocide in Tibet without oceans of tears. That man has had to bear along with so many Tibetans the decimation, the calculated, organized, orchestrated murder of 2.5 million Tibetans, Balmé Zetong, and his, his ongoing empire embodied by Xi Jinping today. That's a whole other discussion, is, is that and he's a man I'd like to have a conversation with, the Xi Jinping. I really wish I could be invited to Davos. That I would live for. I would love to put high doses of DMT in their minds and have the most goddess, god-like, massage therapists physically touch their bodies with beauty and warmth and care and respect and safety and have them force visually fed the most horrific images and where every one of the victims are saying, you caused this with your Belt and Road Initiative. You caused this with your diabolical totalitarianism. I am the result of your ignorance and I forgive you. Ah, give me some more acid. Until they fucking melt down their evil into the great ocean of acceptance. And we have an epic moment of really embodying what you're suggesting quicker than later. Let's get over this glitch, okay? These dudes are ignorant pricks in power. And we need to find creative ways to actively, creatively instigate every form of revolution and rebellion, not just speaking out, poetry, art, intimacy, voice, sound, you name it, literature, film, radical expressions of transformational greatness. We refuse to participate in your narrative, Mr. Fauci, Mr. Biden, Mr. Oligarch on Wall Street, Mr. Silicon Valley, Mr. Facebook, Mr fucking canceling, canceling Dr. Robert Malone on fucking Twitter. What are you thinking, man? What dickhead has got you in your mouth? (laughs) And that's just a mild little satirical, spontaneous riff. Imagine if they were in person, what we could do to them. What would you do? And that, that to me is the ultimate expression of activism. It's like, I want to see this earth regenerate. And guess what? You're a major contaminant to that happening soon. You know, the majority of my family and community are really rad. But you, dude, got it all wrong. I know you got the loot. I know you got the technology. But we got the heart power. I think we're seeing, this is where I'm right coming back around to you. I see we are in a heart-powered revolution in the world. And it's rising up. Summer rising up, Joanna rising up, Christine rising up, Lily's rising up, Starheart's rising up, Miley's rising up, right? This community is rising up despite the fact of one of the leaders at the fucking ridiculous hospital that we're at who tried to cancel Malone. But you're a dude, man. You're just an ignorant dude. We love you too, but you're an octopus. (laughs) <laughs> you know, you know. so how do we deal with this kind of thing to raise the status of this belief system becoming real? Enough encroaching darkness. Okay, our freedoms and liberties are being taken. I don't want a Q code to talk about whether I can fucking go to Manas. 
Okay, I don't want to belong to the cult of social scores. If it goes down, okay, you're down the rabbit hole. Too much Naomi Wolf, too much Bannon. But hey, man, you know, places that I used to frequent like Washington, D.C. and New York City, it's looking pretty bleak. You can't even get a fucking Big Mac without a Q code. <laughs> really? God, great, because the more Big Macs that are eaten, the less people on the planet. <laughs> Feed them free. <laughs> May it be to your own. But hey, listen, you know, it's coming quickly. Yeah, it's coming quickly. So I think all I can say is, you know, thank you for bringing up the question. Thank you for your beautiful story. And may we collectively in solidarity here rise up to the most radiant level of courage and grace under pressure in our littlest of ways. You know, not to get too carried away, but I may not ever see you again past this next minute. They told me I could die any second, even if I sneeze too much. Someone was there to testify. And... You know, one of the littlest things I do, because I, I, you know, I am who I am where I am right now, which is primarily in retreat. And I'm in the few times that I go out, you know, whether it be talking to the petrol pump. <laughs> does it talk back? It does. It says, I want more money. <laughs> but, you know, to those behind the plastic counter masked, men and women who work at the counters at Mana's and other shops and Whole Foods. I asked the other day, I told Summer about a month ago, I asked the one woman there, what's it like doing your job if I can ask? And she looked at me like you're looking at me and I'm looking at you and she says, you know, no one's fucking asked me that in five years being here like that, just like that. Okay. Real quick. Next, I'm gonna go around and um, have other questions. We can talk privately after. Other questions that might be important to you at all, and if not, we'll come back to your story. I don't have a question, but I have a comment about, uh, or maybe I have a question that um, <clears throat> about pure awareness because. Um, most of the women here have been on this journey with me of cancer and chemo, and that's why you didn't recognize me at first. And when I first got the diagnosis, <clears throat> I definitely went down the rabbit hole. It immediately, things became incredibly clear and simplified, not complicated, very simplified, very direct. and. Uh, it was interesting being in fear for about, for me, fortunately, it was only about 24 hours of real fear, of, of amazing fear. And then it was just anxiety for a couple months. And as you refer to drugs, thankfully, for me, it was the CBD, uh, marijuana, <coughs> CBD, THC, the marijuana was totally the best medicine that saved, really saved me. And, um, but then as I learned more about my condition and did, <coughs> and did my research, I became more and more confident and more, and more liberated and really saw the whole thing as this incredible gift. And, and it, I think that the kiss of death really clears the mirror, the dust that did not align on that mirror. The kiss of death makes things so vivid and precious and all the little manini things I couldn't care less about. Mm. And um, um, and it's much easier, and meditation became just such medicine for me. Mm -hmm. and cellular regeneration and lighting up all my cells mm -hmm. and, and, and mm -hmm. going into all the different levels of healers and the lineage of healers and, our, and mm -hmm. all of that, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the cosmic stellar that you've referred to 
how we're spinning here with this jig that we're in this huge cosmos. And um, I just see it as an amazing gift, and I'm feeling it as a gift, and um, it has become really easy, honestly. Well, it's, it's interesting because I, because of the process, I really drop into the moment because I had to. Mm. I couldn't do other things. The fatigue is amazing. The chemo mm. fatigue is <laughs> unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it just dropped me so much into the moment that the moment became really this place where I, I can access and, and mm -hmm. dwell. And I realized this funny dichotomy of, you know, we say be in the moment and there's really no other place we can be. And yet, <laughs> I, I totally differ with that, but go ahead. And yet it's really difficult to be in the moment. It's I think the moment is way overrated, personally. <laughs> thinking of the, the moment. Not, uh, no offense to your moment, yeah, but no, my moment, I, way overrated. No offense taken. Manini stuff doesn't bother me. No I'd much yeah, rather have continuity in the space. But to me, the moment is the pure awareness. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's just a semantic thing here. So I could say instead, pure awareness. Yeah, this, this idea of proximity of presence, you know, and this idea of the now being only here is way too myopic and narrow a perception for me. And it's also so relative. I've met so many people. I've been in war zones. The now sucks. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want to be in the now. You want to be somewhere other than here. And they live through imagination. They live through hope. They live through projection. And there's wisdom in that skill. Mm -hmm. Not just seeing through the scope of an assassin's rifle and who you can kill or how well you can be present. You have to sometimes question that person is not an enemy. You've been conditioned to believe they're an enemy, even though I'm a perfect assassin and I've studied the power of now, I'm mindfully present, is way overrated. <laughs> and this idea that death has cut me back to being in the moment now only is really bogus for me. I'd much rather know that I'm gonna see my daughter again than only right now. And I've been so active in the engagement of fullness for so fucking long, how much more full do you need? So I want to break out of the myopia of the now to include, a you know, what's keeping me active is like, what is your value in the society and community? Think out of myself. It's easy to focus. Medical community wants me to really focus on me. Hospice wants me to focus on me. But one of the gifts in this process for me is to not focus so much on me anymore and focus on other. Never give up is one thing, but never give up on other. And part of that is the imagination, you know, and it's, it's gotten a lot of negative press in the spiritual scene to use thought into the future. I think it's the negating and the neglect of projecting out of the now into the future that we've come to this precipice of the now being that which has almost killed us. We're so preoccupied here that we've missed the bigger picture. And so I really fundamentally at this stage of my life really rail against the obsession and the fetish in our culture. This is not indirectly directing this to you. It's a personal thing to the now being so precious. Yeah, I don't think present moment is the same as the now because it's way more expanded than that. Okay, well, then you have your own philosophy. I'm just yeah, saying that yeah. the now by, by language doesn't really work well for me anymore. But I didn't I'm not saying that you said it right or wrong. I'm saying I heard yeah. the... Mm -hmm. I, I think you did say the word now many times, actually, in the conversation. Oh, maybe, perhaps I did. I yeah, you know, did. It's on record. Present, you could relook at it. The present moment is, yeah. doesn't necessarily mean the now to me. Anyway, it's been recorded, and it's not about what you said or didn't say. I'm just saying on a, on a rift between us, both of us in terminal conditions, it seems like. Are your conditions terminal? Yeah. Well, then... Well, we all have term our terminal, so... Well, that's a very, that's, I'll, I can tell you it's very different to be diagnosed with terminal know. and knowing that you're going to die at some point in life. Mm -hmm. So I also disagree with everyone's terminal. I do agree that it's everyone's terminal, but it's a very different can of worms. That, that's a Bodhi uh, comment, it's everybody's terminal. It's, again, it's part of the now click. And I, <laughs>
you know, and I really do appreciate the language that's culturally sanctioned to hold the complexities. But now that it's become more pixelated for me personally, a lot of that culturally sanctioned elitist spiritual language doesn't hold up. That's all. And I can only say it's true for me. I'm not saying it's true for you. That's all. At all. But now I'm in this space and I'm, I'm really working diligently to document the evidence of this new topography. Because it's a type of dimension that I haven't heard or seen much except with very rare individuals who are willing to lose the gravity of culturally sanctioned spiritual psychological truths. The rebirthing concept is one of them. Far more interesting than being in the now for me. Far, far more. Shows promise, possibility, plasticity. Plasticity, what does that mean? <laughs> Neural existential pathway sculpting from here to there to there. Is it all happen right here? No. <laughs> no, it's hyperdimensional intelligences orchestrating this incredible symphony. And it's so, believe me, I've been obsessed with the now. You cannot be a meditator or a monk and survive one day without being obsessed with being present. But you begin to see that it's an ecosystem far larger than now. And people, again, dogmas, the religious dogma of the new age. I can know the 10 words, the church of, of orthodoxy of what's spiritually correct especially on a medical diagnosis now in hospice. These medical orthodoxies, how you should feel with an illness. Like those of you who watch, did any of you watch the Bodhi B discussion? You know, it's so, I love Bodhi B. He's going to bury me. Okay, he's brother. He's going to bury me. He's unthinkably genius. But that doesn't make me right or wrong, ultimately, or him right or wrong. But there's, there's ways to reinvent the paradigm of this process. And frankly, one of the touch words in this process that doesn't really work for me is grieving. It's a different process. And there's eco grief that's been so sanctified right now. How could you not feel the, you know, I don't make any joke about it, but I do make satirical, irreverent jokes about it. I try my best to feel, I uh, kind of feel like happy at the moment. <laughs> really? Grieving the loss of your daughter? Now she and I are on like wickedly awake terms. And what about your bestest bestie, Janine, okay? She and I are super fucking down. It's like no grieving. It's like rad celebration. What I feel bad about is the rest of you. And I go, you got to work it out with these idiots in government and Fauci. But for me, you know, I am leaving the party because there's too much drunkenness in this scene for me. And it's not a grieving of that. I kind of feel like I don't even want to leave it for Salvation Army. I'm moving on. And so there's a part of me that's in this ecstatic dance with the God. And I don't know whether that resonates with you or where you're at inside, but I'll tell you, it's work to hear your own existential music and not to dance to the music of the acceptable protocol spiritually, meditatively. My hospice nurses will testify. Summer's been there to a few of them. They cannot believe at times the dialogue that they're hearing. I've had nurses and doctors cry at me. They can't handle the idea that I'm handling an illness like this that could cripple you in pain in any second, and they say you'll explode. 
they can't believe that you could handle the anxiety that they project on you and they begin to cry. I'm taking care of the surgeon. I'm taking care of the doctor. I'm taking care of the nurse. And so the, I, I bring this up is like, don't believe me about anything, obviously. That's so obvious. But be willing to <laughs> really <laughs> take your Jesus off the cross and give yourself the liberty of your own truth. That to me is the beauty of the gift of what we're going through right now. What's really true with you? And if you have a few friends that survived the process, if you're being open and honest, you're lucky. Many nowadays I just can't talk to because what is there to hold back? You don't like me? You're not going to what? <laughs> or that we differ of an opinion? Look at who we really differ with. I differ with the dictator in Burma. We're family. If we can't have active fucking existential spiritual dialogue today, that's what's missing, right? Hello? Get over it. I'm not wrong. <laughs> I'm not the one. I'm the easy target, right? I can exacerbate your denial just like being irritating to you just to show you how idiotic you are, how projection-oriented you are. Look at Donald Trump. Look at Anthony Fauci. Look at Biden. Look at Xi Jinping. These easy targets. What's missing is face-to-face -face dialogue. You know? I went to see Ryan Cole. I went to see Dr. Malone. Oh, you are part of that clan of people who deny the efficacy of the vaccine. I don't think I ever want to talk to you again. In fact, I'm going to cut off my Patreon donation to you monthly because you're aberrant. I don't like your energy. I've never liked you anyway. Now you've convinced me I don't like you ever. Can't wait until you die. I will not even come and put a flower on your grave even if Bodhi B buries your ass. <laughs> <laughs> what can you do to insult me <laughs> without insulting yourself first? That's what's missing right now is this kind of self-reflective, where's the dialogue, right? If only, if only there was the dialogue in this wicked crucifix that we're hearing everywhere, the butchers in technology cancellation. Fuck you. I refuse to cancel myself. What are you going to do? Take my Facebook account down? <laughs> Cut me off of LinkedIn? When you're honest, believe me, you will lose the few people that are dear and true to you. So it's better to be pretending, even when you're dying, to make sure that you have people at your funeral. They don't like you anyway, no matter what you're saying, so don't even trust that. <laughs> Better to be real and know that what you are has been sanctified by the beautiful expression of love. I really know that you love me. And so that's more of the issue rather than grieving. It's like, can I get closer to you, please, daughter? Can I get closer to you? Please, Summer, can I get closer to you, Janine? Can I get closer to you, Catherine? Can I get closer to you, Martina? Can I get closer to you, Sophie? So that there is no grieving. <laughs> I want to go out in a thunderstorm of love. <laughs> that means, as for me, Charles Bukowski, I don't know whether you like him or not, but you know, he says, Live so fully that you make death tremble. You know, easier said than done, right? But my books, read all four of them, Burma's Voices of Freedom. You'll read 37 out of the 300. They fucking made their torturers tremble because they empowered their dignity over the violation of these idiots. There are examples of heroism. There are examples. 
<clears throat> Namaste, end of a day, beginning of a new birth, a new life, a new future. May I encourage you to take what's real, beautiful, beneficial, anoint it with your own personal being, obviously leave everything else behind. Enjoy the sovereignty of your own truth. Have a beautiful evening from my heart to yours. Thank you for opening up your sacred space, your heart, your temple. And uh, should you want to suffer through another day of this, <laughs> come tomorrow. I chose to do this with Johanna primarily for myself. And everything I'm saying today uh, truly is for me. I need to hear it. Because if you don't say it, you fucking die unsaid. And if I can't walk my talk, fuck you, Alan. So may there be a message in that. Hope to see you tomorrow at 10. Have a beautiful night. And uh, thank you from my heart. So we can leave our bankings and things here. Would that be all right?